Thank Good you. evening. Um, I'm Arie Nair. I'm president of the Open Society Institute, and I'm uh, very glad to welcome you here this evening for a discussion of uh, Viktor Oshotinsky's book, uh, Human Rights and Their Limits. Um, before I say anything about the, um, the speakers uh, for this evening, um, you'll see that the, uh, the event is being uh, videotaped. Uh, it will be available on OSI's website, and you have fair warning, therefore, that um, if you take part in the discussion uh, this evening, your comments will be recorded for all time and will be uh, <laughs> available, so uh, be, be warned. Um, uh, Viktor Oshotinsky uh, is uh, my colleague. Uh, in the, uh, the Open Society Institute. He serves as a member of the, um, the International Advisory Board of the Open Society Institute, and he has various other positions within uh, OSI, which I uh, won't go into. He also is a uh, professor um, at the Central European University um, in, based in Budapest, and um, uh, teaches in the Legal Studies program at the Central European University. Uh, he has also had uh, affiliations with uh, a variety of law schools, the University of Warsaw, um, Chicago, no? Never. 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 Okay. No. I was kicked out in 68 and never asked after okay. that to All come right. back. Okay. All right. Sorry. No. Um, okay. The University of Chicago Law yeah. School. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's almost, that's also too. You know. Okay. And, and the University of, of Connecticut. Um, uh, and he's uh, written uh, quite a number of, of other books. Um, uh, Richard Wilson, who will take part in the discussion um, this evening, uh, was trained as an anthropologist and has served as uh, director of the Human Rights Institute at the University of Connecticut for the, uh, for the past um, eight years. And uh, we're going to begin by um, asking Victor to, um, uh, to talk a little bit about the, uh, the book. Uh, and then I'm going to ask uh, Rick Wilson to, uh, to make some comments, and then I'm going to uh, uh, initiate a discussion and perhaps uh, raise um, some questions uh, focusing on issues where uh, I may have some doubts about um, the, uh, the points of view expressed by, by Victor. Fabulous. Okay. So thank, Victor. You, thank you, Arya. I just want to say at the beginning that this book in great deal combines my life experience at my research. It was, most of it was written at uh, four or five times of my visits at the Human Rights Institute at the University of Connecticut. I want to acknowledge Gary Gladstein, who founded, founded this institute to great deal, and also my professorship over there, and I'm grateful for this. Uh, I wrote this book primarily to put in order this combination of my curiosity and life experiences with research that I was doing and teaching that I've been doing for almost 20 years. And uh, mm, uh, I just want to say about life experience. In 1968, I was a young assistant at the law school. That was the only time I was there at the War University of Warsaw. And we had some purges and the demonstrations at that time. Uh, we went to the streets or uh, to the university uh, 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 campus and demonstrated for freedom of expression, freedom of speech, all these other freedoms. And at that time, we never used the notion of human rights. It was 1968. We were trying to justify our protest in the terms of communist government violating its own communist constitution of 1952. And then in 1976, we had some other workers' riots this time in Poland. And at that time, human rights were already used as a justification. And in 1980, at Solidarity period and 881, human rights was basically the crucial justification for the protest and the legitimate 
legitimization of the protest. So something happened between <coughs> 1968 and 1976-1980, which was <coughs> first of all that human rights became legitimate issues with the uh, ratification of the uh, signing first, then ratification of the human rights pacts, and also the return and emergence of human rights, international human rights movement, at something that was justifying claims to freedom and better life that did not happen before. And uh, I remember around that time I was interested to study the issue of human rights. And I thought <coughs> that if I go to the West and to get to the library or bookstore, I will find a lot of books about what human rights are, what they are not, about history of human rights. And to my, to my dismay, I didn't find many. I found a lot of articles or books specific about some human rights issue, but I did not find some. I wanted to have like fundamental primer about human rights in the 1980s. I couldn't find that. I could not find much about history. And I started my own research. But uh, with time, this research was combined with my involvement with Open Society Institute in various human rights projects and programs. And I write in the introduction to my book about six or seven very important experiences in my life and in that uh, involvement in which uh, I started to think differently or some new area of research was opened to me by my practical involvement or something that I did not see before. And uh, um, also, uh, as I said in my acknowledgement to my colleagues from Open Society Board, uh, Justice Initiative Board, Human Rights Governance Grant Program, I hope that reading this book you will realize how much you contributed to this book by experience, by uh, finding common things that never came to my mind, uh, like about the importance of inclusion and citizenship issues that I encountered the first time with OSI, or even uh, about a year or so ago, I had a very skeptical <coughs> attitude towards the so-called right to development until I found that the Open Society Justice Initiative is preparing cases about the pillage of natural resources which are based on the concept of the right to development and that was also extremely important for me. Uh, I could see in 1990s, 1980s human rights really growing in importance and at the same time I could see also it sent some places and some were not abuse but overuse of human rights. People started more with with human rights becoming something acknowledged and good money, you know, to use. People started to use that money for many transactions to which this money, I believe, do not belong. And that's why I was also interested with the uh, limits of human rights. And basically, where do they belong, where they don't? And that's what the book uh, came out to be about. It has a historical chapter. Uh, initially, it was the second chapter, but I owe that to Richard Wilson and Andrzej Rapaczynski, who couldn't come today, in their reviews of the book, that I changed completely the structure, redo the, uh, the historical chapter, and started the book with that. And then I deal with four basic issues, the relationship between human rights and democracy, claiming basically that excess of the democracy is indispensable for rights and rights are indispensable for democracy. However, the excess of rights is in a sense impoverishing democracy and political process and vice versa, the excess of democracy can be very dangerous to rights. In the next chapter I deal with rights and needs and social and economic rights issue which is very much debated and discussed and I also try to reach some compromise by saying that actually I prefer to talk about social and economic <coughs> needs, some of which, some of which in some situations can be, uh, 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 to some of which the rights can be applied. Uh, and uh, I also come up with some specific uh, issues uh, that differ in my understanding 
social and economic rights from civil political rights and uh, these are two basically the first that they originated from a uh, sense of obligation of the ruler or community to the individual rather than as rights and they were claimed that way and uh, that leads me to the understanding that these rights can be made conditional that uh, even when they are rights, they can be made conditional upon some contribution to the society by the recipient of such rights, while civil liberties and political rights so are absolutely unconditional. But I make it much more um, uh, defined uh, in, in, in that chapter. Uh, then I deal with the uh, issue of universality of rights in the chapter of rights and culture. <laughs> and I distinguish between hard and soft universalists and I support something that I call soft universalists, which is not imposing the philosophy of rights or even rights, definitely philosophy, on others, but rather sharing the experience and considering rights as self-limitation. And to me, perhaps the most important from my perspective was the last thing which deals with human rights and other values, human rights and ethics human rights and the search for meaning, human rights and happiness. And I say that to, the, to these issues, the rights are pretty limited, of limited use. They are still indispensable for us to be responsible. We have to have freedom to be responsible and to act as responsible people. But basically, if we search for meaning or for happiness, we, we ourselves limit these choices and limit the rights. and. Uh, uh, this became to me pretty so important that I ended the entire book with the uh, letter to a student that deals basically with, with, with these issues. Overall, I think that this was, mm, for me, a long trip, very long. It was definitely the most difficult of over 20 books that I wrote, and um, perhaps one of the most satisfactory. Uh, 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 to me, but I don't know. I will just now shut up and listen if it is as satisfactory to others. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Rick Wilson. Thanks. I'm going to start with um, talking about the title of the book and the idea of limits. Uh, just dawned on me as you were speaking at the end there about uh, human rights, the end of your book, and human rights and ethics, human rights and intimacy. You could also have called the book Human Rights and Why They Can't Buy You Love because it does very much end on how so many of the most important things in life uh, actually human rights don't help you with. Um, what's the value? I guess a question we, we could start with is what is the value of understanding the limits of human rights? If human rights are a good thing, which we agree they are, can't we just keep expanding their purview and their mandate, transforming each new area to the benefit of all? Putting limits on human rights, isn't that the voice of defeat and pessimism. I would argue, so I think Victor argues, no. Um, Victor's is very much the voice of a human rights moderate. Uh, Connecticut is sometimes referred to as the land of steady habits, which is a polite way of saying it can be boring as hell. But um, Victor wrote this book out in the wilds of stores, uh, surrounded, al always in October, over a, a 10 year period. Um, surrounded by fall foliage. In fact, I remember you calling me a few years ago saying, Richard, I'm in love. And I said, wonderful, Victor. Uh, Eva isn't here yet. Uh, she arrives next week. And he said, I'm in love with the nature here. And you describe being very inspired uh, to write in that environment. But I think there's uh, partly your character, but there's certainly an environmental attribute to this as well. Um, you're clearly aware of the value of human rights, but very cautious about overextending them. And you point out that history is full of big ideas, some of them very good ones, uh, seemingly at the time, but that it, they've been discarded. And I think Victor's book does make human rights more flexible in the beginning of the 21st century and better prepared for the new challenges that lie ahead. In an international setting where there's an emphasis on the interdependence and indivisibility of rights, how rights always come together very nicely with each other. Uh, there's a neglect sometimes of uh, a full understanding of the tensions 
Um, and, I, and I place Victor's thinking within a kind of earlier tradition of liberalism. You only cite Berlin once, but uh, Isaiah Berlin's sense of we must make difficult decisions, that good things are intention, and that human rights are not always synonymous with democracy struck me as very much in that earlier, perhaps post-war liberal tradition. And, and you remind us that um, populism and majority rule can threaten human rights, particularly with regard to immigrants and minorities, and also, on the other hand, that excessive constitutionalizing of rights can impoverish democracy, and that you can't always place the important debates about resource allocation or anything important in a society within, uh, you know, in a sense, kick them out of touch, as you would say, to use a rugby metaphor. Now it's in the Olympics. I can use this in front of you. Kick it out of touch and place it outside of the, the usual boundaries of uh, democratic deliberation. This tension seems to be irresolvable, and we must accept it. And I think that's an important insight of the book. Perhaps more positively, um, Victor tells us that human rights are trumps. He understands them as primarily moral, uh, without a, 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 in a moral sense. Um, th although they can be legalized, they don't have a primarily legal basis. So he sees them as universally moral rights of a fundamental character. and This combines with his soft universalism. He uses the idea of dignity, as understood by Kant and Jacques Maritain, uh, to do the work around linking dignity with rights. And, and, and I see that as, as very useful. Um, you're cautious against human rights inflation. And you refer to a, a couple of areas, perhaps international relief and humanitarianism and environmental rights, where there's been this inflation of rights. But yet you're also willing to explore new and emergent areas of human rights. For instance, the horizontal application of rights without the heady lack of abandon that one uh, often finds in this, in this field. And, and I have a couple of, of questions for you to see I mean, these are areas that maybe I didn't fully understand. I mean, I, I agree with so many things in the book that uh, it's very difficult to find uh, elements that I disagree with. I think there were one or two gaps. Um, one of the gaps is international justice. There's not really a discussion of uh, the ICTY, the ICTR, the International Criminal Court. And, and I think I, having discussed this with you, I think I know why, but um, it seemed that you, you, you didn't want to hang your aspirations for human rights very much upon international justice institutions. And I don't know if that's, you know, you can't put everything in a book or if there's a deeper, uh, a, a deeper reasoning there. Um, another area that I wanted to ask you about was uh, social and economic rights. Um, in this chapter, you acknowledge and you're very aware of the criticisms of socioeconomic rights. You talk through the constitutions that have sought around the world <laughs> to, um, to place um, these rights within a Bill of Rights. And, and, and I wondered where you stood on this. And, and I think maybe when you discussed the Krutbrum case in South Africa, the South African Constitutional Court, tell me if I'm wrong, uh, in the discussion of the right to housing in South Africa, that you seem to be affirming the South African Constitutional Court's approach to, to this, that the, the court decided that it could not dictate policy to the legislature on housing, but that it could demand that the legislature deliver such a policy and have it reviewed according to its constitutionality. So my question there is, have I understood your reading of socioeconomic rights, that you don't think one can instantiate socioeconomic rights and then read them off very clearly from the Constitution to the legislation, but that in, instead they're in a kind of dynamic exchange where the, 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 the constitutionalizing, in a sense, sets the, the parameters of the rules of the game and then leaves the rest up to the legislature. So then I would come back to your question of human rights as trumps, because it strikes me that, that while you say they're trumps, actually you really only mean some of them are trumps and others aren't. And so, it strikes me that whilst having established the strong position that human rights are trumps at the beginning, you then, and maybe I've misconstrued or misunderstood, it's perfectly possible, 
um, that you seem to be edging back on that when it comes to socioeconomic rights and seeing them as much more conditional, as derogable under certain types of conditions. So then we really have three positions on human rights that one could take. Either all human rights are trumps, and if something is instantiated as a human right, it's instantiated in a fairly absolute way. Secondly, some are trumps and the rest are derogable. And how do you decide? Generally, within international law, the idea is that really only three rights are uh, understood as non-derogable, uh, torture, genocide, <laughs> and slavery. And the rest can be der uh, derogated under certain conditions which are specified or not. And then thirdly, uh, the position that none are Trumps and that they all must be understood in a different way. So I guess I would ask you to, and this is far too much in that, I, I just want to, uh, to ask you to, to clarify that if possible. The final point I'd like to make, if I haven't run on too long as it is, I, I just want to apologize. I have read this book three times now, so there, there are too many, <laughs> there, there's too much in here uh, to really throw out succinctly. But the, the final point is that I feel like part of the book was written in, during an era of globalization, which kind of came to an end last year. Uh, and, it, and it felt to me, and this is not your fault, because anyone would have, have, have reacted similarly. But in, in, in the section of your book, I'm thinking here around page 83 and onwards, you talk about nation states uh, losing their power over economies. Uh, with the exception of the U.S. and China, that governments are unable to control the decisions affecting their economies, and you grant a great deal of power to multinationals uh, with easy electronic transfers of capital, of relocating factories from Brazil to the Philippines to Thailand. But perhaps that was the result of an era which lasted roughly between 1985 and 2008. And do we need to think about it differently now? Uh, nation states stand a little taller than they did this time last year. And really only they have had the ability uh, to withstand the economic um, recession, catastrophe, whatever you want to call it. And perhaps during that era we exceeded too much to multinational corporations and bought into, uh, were too accepting of the advocates of globalization. Um, and, and, and accepted too readily the idea that the state was easily transcended and its powers amounted to very little in terms of, uh, for instance, environmental regulation, financial regulation, or regulation of wages and conditions in the workplace, just to give a few examples. So would you, if you were back in stores in October writing this book still, uh, which may be a nightmare for you, but uh, yes. if you were two writing it now, would it two be... Two weeks are left of October. <laughs> you know, would, you re so. would you rewrite that section? Okay. Um, before you answer uh, some of those uh, questions, um, le let me pick up at least on, on one of them and then uh, come to others. But um, uh, Rick Wilson referred uh, to... Um, uh, your idea uh, that um, certain rights are, are moral rights and you distinguish uh, between moral rights and, and legal rights. And, and I, I have the question as to whether it is useful um, to use the term rights uh, in circumstances in which uh, they are not legally enforceable. Uh, that is, uh, how is something a right um, if you can't um, actually um, uh, ensure um, that the, uh, the right is uh, respected? Um, and do you worry that in using the, um, the term rights more broadly, uh, that you are um, softening the whole idea uh, of rights? Uh, that if um, some rights um, uh, are conditional, if some rights uh, are not legally um, enforceable, um, does that um, undermine the, um, the concept uh, of rights? Uh, shouldn't rights be um, uh, a uh, concept that um, uh, does take precedence um, over um, other considerations? And uh, if there are circumstances in which you um, uh, 
uh, you see uh, rights as, as being uh, conditional, um, uh, does that weaken the, um, the entire concept of, of rights? Okay. It's, it's, you know, let me start with my amazement that you ask this question and you are not a lawyer and I have to answer it and I am a lawyer so at least by, by instruction or education and uh, I would, my answer would be very simple when we, when, if I use the word rights just the word rights then the thesis implied in question would be right yes, rights need to be enforceable and forced but when I use the word human rights, it's a different thing. That's the difference between rights, the word rights, and the word human rights. Human rights was historical invention, basically in modern sense of the uh, 1930s and 1940s when they were developed. And the people who are creating the concept of human rights and declaration of human rights, Actually, the last thing that they thought at that time about was their enforceability in legal sense. It is a fabulous testimony of Farid Don Hoveida, who, who died last year, who was the uh, secretary to the Iranian declaration at the, uh, the United Nations work about human rights. He said this, this has to do with this issues of universality and cultural specificity, and he says, Basically, most of the people from outside of Europe, they had problems with human rights. They liked them, they supported them because Americans wanted and the West wanted, and they thought that they will give them legitimacy for, uh, for national liberation of the countries that were not, uh, that were colonialized at that time. But they thought that even if there are some differences with their cultural tradition, they will never be enforced that it will be not enforceable. So if we talk about human rights when the term was coined in the 1940s. No, but it was surely it was coined earlier. I mean, surely um, if we think of um, you know, the, uh, the 18th century um, authors of the American Bill of Rights and the French uh, Declaration of, uh, of Rights, um, surely they were um, uh, ahead of us, or you can go back to the 17th century and the English Bill of Rights, or go back to the, um, uh, the arguments of the, uh, the religious dissenters uh, of the, uh, the 17th century who were arguing for their own rights. I mean, they had the idea um, that rights um, should be legally enforceable. Yeah, but they, only Thomas Paine was using the word that we can vaguely translate into human rights. They were not no. using the term human rights. They were, were rights using the rights of man, yeah, they were the using rights the of rights man. of uh, mankind. I, they were, uh, uh, even I, the term I, human I, rights appears I, from I time to yeah, time. Yeah, but I think these were rights of, uh, you know, white male property owners and they were individual rights. I, I, I make very clear in historical chapter in the part that I did not get enough into details because I would need another 20 years. I, I distinguish between 18th century concept of individual rights. Here you have a right which is given to individual as distinct from medieval concept where rights are basically protecting community and <coughs> rather than individuals. In the 18th century, it's, they st are located in the individual, and basically for authors of these constitutions, they should be enforceable. And I think that this is one of the basic difference between that concept and the return of rights two centuries later in 1940s in the notion of human rights that for some people that were prior to that process, like Mandelstam or Frangulis in the 1920s, they wanted rights to be enforceable, to be enforced. But for the, for the, for the framers of the Universal Declaration, not so. And now to, you know, I, I think that, that when rights came back in the 1970s in the process in which you were so uh, wonderfully involved, of course, civil liberties and political rights for human rights movement, for international human rights against, were the aim of something that has to be enforced. For me, that I was a recipient of your efforts in communist Poland, 
I would think the following. The concept, the notion of human rights, of course, this was not enforceable or not enforced in communist Poland. It was very useful as a moral concept, as a concept, I think, that one of uh, perhaps important contributions in this book is a very little section that is entitled Between Morality and Law. And I believe that we, if we look at that, because concept of human rights, I claim, is basically moral, primarily moral. It has ultimate goal of becoming legal whenever it can be legalized, either by constitutionalization, legalization, or as uh, Professor Meron wrote in his books through the adjudication of, of the courts and the uh, international uh, human rights. So this, this, is, this is the thing that is a goal. But when you look at that, many new rights or rights applied to the groups that did not cherish these rights were first formulated as moral postulate that was that was given the name of human rights. Then, with the attempt to make it legal and to legalize them. And Victor, I think this you is said that when um, you were first involved in 1968. Um, you were trying to get compliance with the Polish Constitution. And um, in, in fact, um, if you think of the, um, the rights movement in, in the Soviet bloc, that legalistic uh, approach was, was very much um, characteristic of, of what took place. The, the human rights movement uh, in the Soviet Union probably dates to um, to 1965. For Khalidze, yes. Well, no, well, before that even, before, before Shalidze. Um, I think that the, the opening of it was um, the prosecution of um, uh, Sinyavsky and, and Daniel. And, Daniel. Yes. Mm -hmm. and um, in, I think it was December um, uh, 65, I think December yeah. 5, mm -hmm. um, the first demonstration <laughs> was held in Moscow um, uh, about the um, uh, Sinyavsky and Daniel prosecution. And they chose that day in Moscow because it was Constitution Day um, in uh, the Soviet Union. And the argument of the demonstrators in Pushkin Square um, that evening um, was that Sinyavsky and Daniel should get a public trial which was required by the Soviet uh, constitution. So from the beginning, even in the, um, the communist world, there was this legalistic approach to, uh, to human rights. And one of the things about the, uh, the Soviet Union um, is that the, um, the movement for rights was led by scientists. And yet the scientists uh, were known as legalists. The scientists like Kovalyov and um, uh, Orlov and Sakharov and Chalidze um, were all very much preoccupied um, with detail and evidence and the things which were um, uh, important in science. And so they gravitated toward a legalistic approach and the whole human rights movement in the, uh, the Soviet bloc in fact evolved as a legalistic movement. It may be convenient for you to think that way, but I would, I would change <laughs> one word. You say from the beginning of human rights movement from it was legalistic, and I say at the beginning of human rights movement it was legalistic. And I tell you why I distinguish between okay. from and at, because there is discontinuity. Because at the beginning, <laughs> when there is no ratified human rights documents and human rights movement, people are really talking about constitutions, however useless they are. Now, when the human rights come back through ratification of the pact, second, through the international uh, human rights law, but uh, it getting human rights into international politics, which is political rather than legal, then through human rights, international human rights movement, basically the focus is <coughs> 
not only on legal instrument. And for me, solidarity experience would be very important. Solidarity was political movement when no one talked about legal remedies. No, I, I agree. No with one I, at all. But we were full of human rights. Human rights as the values was the uh, was the le legitimization and justification of our protest, our demands, which were basically political rather than legal. And the uh, the follow-up on that was that uh, even in post-communist country, uh, it took quite a time for the elites really to get into uh, legal culture and uh, legal approach, which was which disappeared when when this 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 notion came in. So I think it is. I, I still I still uh, we have uh, different experiences, perhaps, and that. Uh, can I get a word? Yeah, in sure. <laughs> uh, could could I mean you can both be right. Yeah, um, that's what I think. And that is Okay. Uh, one could distinguish between human rights talk and human rights law. <coughs> and it strikes me that distinction allows you both to be correct. There is a whole area of, of human rights as social movements, uh, the, the moral nature of law. I just think back to in the 1990s in, in Britain, there was this judge, Judge Pickles, who was this old British magistrate, who would do things like, um, send single mothers to jail for three years for stealing a can of baked beans. And this was a real case. And there was moral opprobrium. And th there was a, a clear tabloid campaign. Judge Pickles was driven out. And it was decided that the kind of old hang em and flog em, uh, British style of judgeship, and, and, and in fact, the whole structure of the judiciary, of which 96% were members of private public schools, of which there were only two or three. You know that all changed, and it was a result of this of this genuine kind of transformation of, of moral values. And that strikes me that's the way law changes. So there is that kind of domain of of moral discourse of which human rights overlaps. It can overlap into the legal sphere and be legalized. But but I, I think if one were to take Arya's uh, point to its logical conclusion, um, only the rights that are enshrined in law are human rights, and everything else is moral talk, but then one has no explanation for how things that weren't human rights yesterday are human rights today. And, and so there's no explanation of the you, transformation. You, you, you have to realize that I'm not <laughs> very enthusiastic about an expanding domain of human rights in which uh, something which was uh, a moral argument yesterday is transformed um, into a human right. Um, my uh, approach to, uh, to rights uh, is that it is only by um, keeping the, um, the, the sphere of human rights relatively limited uh, that it is, in fact, possible to argue strenuously and vociferously um, for human rights. I don't want to be diluted in my um, advocacy of human rights by uh, thinking, the, thinking of them as nebulous. And it seems to me that when one is engaged in this expansive approach uh, to, uh, to human rights, uh, that that inevitably um, becomes the, uh, the case. <laughs> and your question to Victor as to, um, uh, to whether rights do trump other concerns, my, uh, my argument would be yes, they do. But I have to then uh, circumscribe my concept of rights because it is only those circumscribed rights that actually can trump other considerations. The right not to be tortured trumps any um, uh, consideration on the other side. There is no circumstance um, in which uh, someone ca could come along and justify uh, torture from my standpoint. And what I fear is that if rights are treated nebulously, then the argument that urgent circumstances um, justify torture uh, will actually prevail. And to me, it's very important to head off um, that kind of uh, argument and to do so, I have to have this um, limited approach uh, to rights. Because uh, if I, Victor mentioned uh, a right to development. I mean, this is the most nebulous um, uh, concept of all. It's nebulous on the one hand. On the other hand, it could only be um, enforced if there were some global institution uh, 
uh, which were capable of taking resources from one place and um, uh, providing them um, uh, to another place. So it's, uh, it's only a, um, a vague notion. But if vague notions like that um, get confused with rights, then um, how well am I going to do in saying that um, the right to speak, the right to a fair trial, um, the right to torture, these are things which um, need to be defended as sacrosanct. But there are many things still that people believe that they should be entitled or that should be respected, even so they are not enforced or they cannot be enforced. The first example, the one that are not enforced, actually in countries where you have the rights enshrined in constitutions and enforced, you don't very seldom you use even you have to use the notion of human rights. In this country, people talk about civil rights because these rights, these civil rights that were enshrined, were enshrined in constitution, and people didn't use all this hazy idea of human rights. But in the countries, that's why human rights was American export rather than use uh, uh, for internal uh, the object, uh, instrument for internal use. But people are calling for human rights in Burma, in communist Poland, in other places, precisely because they are not enforced. And, uh, and, and, and that is the case. The second, I do believe that most of the debates about what is human rights and what is not is basically the debate about their means of en enforcement. If you insist, as Cranston does or others, that all rights should be enforceable, then by definition you will have a very limited, narrow definition or list of rights. <coughs> if you believe that rights can be enforceable in different ways, let's say by constitution and by statutes, as is my position on social and economic rights, or by moral means or some uh, uh, means of the appeal to the conscience of, uh, uh, of humanity, etc., you can have much wider catalog of rights, which are still rights and people are entitled to, but not in the identical way. And I believe in, 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 in differentiated. For me, for example, the most basic human rights, absolutely most basic, is the one you will probably uh, really be surprised or uh, with that or, or, or outraged what I will say, but I will say nevertheless, absolutely fundamental human rights for human being is a right of a child to be loved, of a child, only of a child, and adult people doesn't have such a right, but a child has. The adult people has to give love if he wants to be or she wants to be loved, but a child has. And this will forever become be, be, be moral right. But I will still advertise, and wherever I go, I will talk about this right, because I think this is so fundamental for human dignity. Victor, I won't disappoint you. I, I, I do very much uh, disagree with you. Yeah, no, of course, of course. That, my, 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 my own view of rights um, is that rights are limits on power. Um, that um, it um, is necessary um, to circumscribe the, um, the power uh, of the state or of those who uh, exercise state power or um, to whom state power has been um, delegated uh, in some way. Uh, and um, that approach of um, limits on power um, uh, seems to me um, to um, leave out um, a great many of the desirable things in the world. And the fact that something is uh, important or desirable doesn't mean that um, I can put it into the, um, uh, the category uh, of rights. Um, I think it's uh, sometimes felt by, um, by those who um, champion uh, an expansive notion of human rights um, that it denigrates their cause um, if you don't uh, refer to something uh, as a right. Uh, I have no uh, interest in, in denigrating the significance uh, of those things. I think they simply should be differentiated from rights. Something can be immensely important. The, uh, the child's um, need for love um, can be of immense significance uh, 
uh, but I don't think it's useful um, to, um, to call it a right. What does the child do? Does the child um, uh, then go to um, uh, some arbiter, some judicial body, and say, uh, this right has been uh, denied to me? It, it isn't something that is um, uh, conceivable. Um, and um, I, I think uh, it's, it's useful to limit rights to those things that can be uh, protected by placing limits uh, on the exercise of, of state power. On a, on a historical note, I mean, I think that's a perfectly respectable position, but just as a historical I'm reflection. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad it's not he disrespectful. What does, uh, he's not going to change anyway. So, but, but there's a, a, a great piece in Victor's book where he talks about Charles F.'s article, The Rights Revolution, which is a great you know, discussion of these issues in the United States. And, and what Epps notes is that the entire thrust of progressive left of center politics in the United States since the 1960s has been about the enshrining of rights, from civil rights, disability rights, children's rights, environmental rights. It's been taking elements of progressive politics and seeking to, in some way, shape, or other, have a good Supreme Court decision on it in, in one's favor. And, and, and you could see that recently, perhaps the culmination uh, in the Obama-McCain debate at the end of last year on universal health care, where you see the very polarized positions. And Obama says, I see health care as a right. And McCain says, I see it as a privilege. And there's two stark kinds of, of distinctions there. Uh, and uh, I would see it as a desirable policy. Right. <laughs> and so your argument is that democratic deliberation on the allocation of resources should take place within let, the democratic process. Let, let me, let me process. give you a, a real-world example that um, you know, I happen to be um, uh, close to uh, at this moment. Um, the, the Open Society Institute has um, a foundation in Haiti, uh, as impoverished a country uh, as you could imagine, a uh, country with every um, kind of, of need. Um, and uh, it happens that the woman who uh, served from the time we established the foundation in 1995 um, as the executive director of the foundation, um, not long ago became the prime minister of Haiti. She left um, uh, the post at the, uh, the foundation. And so we've been uh, talking to her about how we can be um, helpful to her uh, as uh, Prime Minister of Haiti. And uh, she says that um, she considers the most urgent need uh, in the country to be um, uh, to reverse the, uh, the problem um, of environmental degradation. She says that last year, um, Haiti was struck over and over again by hurricanes, uh, that because the, um, uh, the mountains had been uh, denuded of their uh, forest cover because the cr trees were cut down over generations uh, for use as uh, charcoal for cooking purposes, um, when the, uh, the hurricane struck, uh, there were uh, massive um, landslides, and schools, clinics, houses were all buried um, by these uh, landslides. Uh, large numbers of people uh, were killed. Um, and uh, she's got to um, do something about this problem of environmental degradation. The dealing with education, dealing with health, um, are uh, crucial issues in Haiti, but she can't address those unless um, she addresses the problem of um, uh, the uh, country's great vul vulnerability to the, um, the storms um, of the, um, uh, the Caribbean. And um, part of her solution is uh, to make it more valuable for Haitians um, to have trees in the ground uh, than cut down, uh, which means that um, the mountains have to be planted with fruit trees, mango trees, um, for example. Um, export businesses have to be created to export the mangoes. There have to be storage facilities, refrigeration, 
uh, transport capacity uh, in order to, uh, to make this solution work. Uh, so there's going to have to be uh, a certain amount of um, capital investment uh, to create the, uh, the infrastructure to deal with um, this problem of environmental degradation. And she has to put to a side um, uh, other concerns because of the limited resources of the country. Now, you take an expansive definition of rights and you say, uh, I have a right to education, I have a right to health, um, I have um, you know, a right to, uh, to social security. And you come to uh, the Haitian government, which has these very limited uh, resources, and you say, give me my right to education, give me my right to health care. And she says, no, I can't do that because I've got to solve this problem as a step towards solving um, those other problems. Is it useful in those circumstances to trump the democratic process with a rights approach? Or should the democratic process work? Should she have to go to the Haitian parliament and persuade the Haitian parliament through the political process that her uh, solution is the right one? Maybe it's not. Maybe a different solution is uh, possible. But the political process setting public policies seems to me the way in which one has to address the urgent needs of that country and superimposing a rights process on something like that uh, would be extremely destructive. Um, now, I don't want to see rights invoked in those circumstances. I want to see the democratic process, the political process, work to try to address the urgent needs of the country. On the other hand, if she were to propose uh, let's say, to torture somebody to stop them from cutting down trees on the mountainside, I would say, no, you can't do that. Or if somebody wanted to speak out against her plan and she tried to suppress that person, I would say, no, you can't do that. Or if she tried to put somebody in prison arbitrarily for opposing the plan, I would say, no, you can't do that. So rights are the place where you say no um, to, um, uh, to those who have uh, authority to those who have power. But rights shouldn't be the mechanism where um, you trump public policy decisions um, that um, may not um, be something that you can um, frame in the international covenant of economic, social, and cultural rights. Arie, basically you wrote my book right now in much better way probably because that's what I'm writing in it. There is only one difference between yeah. us. The one difference is that what you are calling rights now I call constitutional rights and I believe probably as distinct from you that there is also possible use of the word rights which for the rights that are not constitutional. Some of them are statutory, some of them are moral and will remain moral. And I find arguments why is it useful because in that way things that are not considered and acknowledged as rights today can become rights in your sense or better protected rights tomorrow. But I agree whatever you say there is a word for it. this is constitutional rights and my answer to your question yes only constitutional rights are trumps only constitutional rights are trumps to politics politics is very important and there are many rights which are result of politics which are statutory rights if you have a politics and political process that decides about allocation of resources about the social welfare etc as a result of that people are endowed with statutory rights they can claim these benefits the difference is that political process can change these rights in the future can take them away can limit them while when you have something enshrined in the constitution is our constitutional rights which is my understanding of what you just said about rights then political process cannot do that that in trump's political process so this is my answer i actually was responsible for polish constitution precisely with that issue with constitutionalization of social and economic rights and we were in a kind of the uh, uh, very very difficult situation because for legitimacy reasons the constitution that was supposed to go to the public referendum could not leave this issue out completely. 
So it, you had to put these rights in the Constitution and at the same time to take it away. And there are two solutions and, uh, of that that were developed. One that was Spanish and Portuguese actually invented in Ireland, Irish Constitution of 1936 and then developed by the Indian uh, uh, Constitution, which was putting into Constitution something called directive principles or principles of, of public policy which did not create enforceable rights. And the Czechoslovak solution, probably invented by Hermann Schwartz, who couldn't be here tonight, and that was that you put all these social rights in the Constitution, and in one article you made a statement, rights enumerated in this, 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 this chapter will be protected within limits set by the statute. So you put these things and then leave them back or send them back. This is Grossbrom case. This is what uh, uh, actually South Africa Constitutional Court uh, uh, ended up with uh, with the Grossbrom ca case that you put them in the Constitution. But I, I was very curious uh, to your answer to Rick's question. Uh, uh, do you agree with what the South African Constitutional Court did in the Grossbrom case? Yes, I think I agree because they very clearly, you know, uh, that they defined that there has to be, you know, Rodborn ca case can be only considered in view of the South African Constitution, which had the right to housing. And the Rodborn case was what does it mean and what it will be, uh, it will mean. And they said there should be policy. There should be policy that will uh, give Miss Grootboom in the future, not immediately now, or people in that situation, some hopes that they can get housing. If it was put in the Constitution, I think I agree with the judgment. But I do believe that sending very clear message that these rights belong to political process means that they are not Trumps. And I do believe that there are some rights, you know, uh, rights to social security based on the uh, Congress decisions uh, in the United States are nevertheless rights. They are legal rights, but they are not constitutional rights. Uh, and if I can follow up Rick's earlier uh, question, you know, uh, in, in the South African constitutional court cases, there are two other uh, major cases um, dealing with, um, with those kinds of issues. The first was the Subramani uh, case. Uh, this was the uh, the case of the man who kidney. said he, ha yeah, he needed a kidney yeah. transplant, and if he didn't get the kidney transplant, um, uh, he would die. And in fact, uh, I think it was what the day the Constitutional yeah. Court handed down the decision denying him he the died. kidney transplant, he died. He died. Um, and then there was the treatment action case, um, in which the um, uh, the treatment action campaign. Um, uh, ca uh, was challenging uh, President Mbeki's uh, approach to HIV-AIDS and uh, was challenging particularly um, the health department's refusal to provide nevirapine uh, to pregnant women, which would prevent the transmission of um, HIV to, from mother to child. And in that case, the, um, the Constitutional Court uh, ruled that um, Neverapine should be provided to the uh, the children. Essentially, um, the the difference in the outcome of those two cases was the South African Constitutional Court said uh, it would be very expensive to give somebody like Subramani um, the kidney transplant, and the health department has to be able to uh, to make other choices uh, to. Um, uh, provide, let's say, primary care to, uh, to large numbers of people, whereas in the treatment action campaign case, they said, well, it doesn't cost very much to administer the Verapine, and uh, South Africa has been offered a five-year supply uh, free of charge, so um, uh, it's irrational to deny uh, pregnant women the Verapine. So cost effectively became the distinguishing factor. And I'm curious how you would uh, come out um, on, on those two uh, other um, sort of crucial cases in their um, uh, handling of these issues. I think that I read Subramani case. It's becoming very technical and legal, which uh, I, uh, uh, but uh, nevertheless, I will answer. I, I understand Subramani case uh, interpret differently than you. It was not the choice between uh, the kidney for Mr. Subramani and other needs of the 
uh, uh, budget or health issues. That was the issue. Will the fact that Mr. Subramani is very old trump the line of people waiting for kidneys? That was basically the case because they said you you cannot trump, you cannot go and get this kidney now because the health health department is deciding in what order and who will get kidneys and there is no enough kidneys for everyone. So you being uh, old, etc., are unfortunately still on the end of the line and you will not <coughs> live towards that. And I, that's how I understand that. It was not choice between expenses for kidney or other health expenses, but will it trump or not? Uh, I, I, I understood it as mm -hmm. uh, they, the health department's decision was rational in yeah. the super, yeah, Subramani yeah, 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 case, yeah. Mm -hmm. not rational uh, in the treatment action uh, campaign case. I would say that I give the uh, Constitutional Court the uh, power to make such uh, adjustment, you know, to uh, the uh, realities and practice, understanding again that this is basically the issue between rights and public policy, and I, I, I don't have much problem with these two decisions. Okay. If I could dissent Go quickly. Ahead. Well, it just, it just strikes me. I mean, I understand the argument, and it, it, ha it has much to commend it. It's simple, it's elegant, it's clear. But my concern is that it kind of comes to the conclusion that human rights are things that limit state power and are fine as long as they don't cost the government anything. Because as soon as they cost the government something, then they're interfering with the democratic process. And to come back to your Haiti example, there could well be a compelling argument that a child says, I have a right to K-12 to education, which is understood very commonly as an obligation of states to their citizenry, and not just as a constitutional right, but as a human right. Um, and my right to an education trumps the environmental rights, because if it's a choice between mango trees and my education and a lost generation with no education, let's have the education instead of the mango trees. So I could see where compelling arguments could be made on the basis of human rights uh, by individuals who do not want their particular childhood right to education forfeited by a government, however benign and compelling its reasons. Uh, rather than pursue that argument, uh, which I'm very tempted to do. But Arye, I think this <laughs> here, here simply I have to make a statement that I think that this room is big enough to hold your opinion and my different <laughs> opinion about that, really. I, I think I we, we had this discussion a number of times and we have some, some disagreements which to me are, are, are less, less acute probably than to you because I do believe that that there can be various rights and they can be enforced in different ways and there is absolutely there are constitutional rights that trump all other considerations but i believe there are you, you'll never answer to my my saying that can be there statutory rights that are not constitutional that are uh, that are resulting from the state adopting some policy there are still rights people can go to court they cannot yes. go to constitutional yes. no, court. I, I, they I, can I, go I'm, to court i'm all for that. Mm -hmm. um, statutory efforts to deal with such questions because statutory efforts are the periodic um, policies um, that are made through a democratic po process and statutory policies can be altered from time to time. But don't they create rights once they, they are adopted they, they, until they, they, they are create, altered? Um, they create rights. They, they create rights. But not constitutional. Um, <laughs> but they don't create rights in the permanent sense um, in which um, I think we have been uh, talking about rights. Um, they create um, the um, uh, opportunities for people to take advantage of particular policies that are agreed upon uh, through the uh, the democratic process and um, I think we have to make public policies um, in that fashion um, in order to uh, to deal with the immense complexity uh, of the issues that we have to confront but that we need to uh, put aside certain questions and say, no, these are not susceptible to the democratic process. The, the American Bill of Rights we, begins with the words, Congress shall yeah. make no law. We put them and to those five words we put them essentially to say that there are some things which are not subject to the democratic process.
they are so significant that we um, put them aside and you can't touch them in the democratic process. <laughs> but statutes um, mm -hmm. are a, a consequence of the democratic process mm -hmm. and can and should be altered from time to time through the democratic process. There's a chapter on that. It's about the okay. constitutional okay. rights. Uh, constitutional uh, rights are rights uh, that are uh, trumping everything. I, I, I want to take you in a slightly different direction. Fabulous. Okay. Uh, can um, I get more water? From <laughs> You know, I haven't touched mine, so why you don't, don't you... You don't need one? Uh, uh, share. Uh, what, what, uh, why you will you? share with uh, me. Okay. I will share your water. This is still um, not touched, you know, in th case th this you is need a, it. This is a passage which um, uh, really startled me when, when I came to it. Um, uh, it's at page 174, uh, and it says, In short, human rights organizations today pursue many different goals and represent a number of diversified in interests. Not surprisingly, they also adopt different strategies. They have to compete for decreasing resources from the West and for limited resources in societies in which they are active. The resulting differentiation has led to diminished hopes for the human rights movement ever reunifying successfully again. It is difficult to define a common set of ideas and values to which a majority of human rights organizations could uh, subscribe. And it's really that, that last sentence, that it's difficult to define a common set of ideas and values to which a majority of human rights organizations could subscribe, that, that I found um, so startling. And uh, my view has been um, that there is um, a mainstream set of concerns that characterizes the, um, the human rights movement um, and that um, what in fact makes it a, uh, a successful movement, an effective movement, uh, is that they, there is that common set of values and, and common set of ideas. And there are uh, certainly differences at the margins, um, but the, the core beliefs of the human rights movement, uh, the belief in um, uh, in freedom of inquiry and expression, the belief in due process of law, uh, the belief in uh, the right not to be um, tortured or um, uh, physically abused um, uh, in, in some way, uh, a belief in uh, the right to privacy, I would add, even a, a belief in the right to, uh, to take part in self-government, um, that these are core beliefs and values and that they are, in fact, um, shared within the human rights movement worldwide, and that it is uh, an effective movement um, because of that. And if it doesn't have um, that core set of beliefs and, and values, uh, obviously the, uh, the right to, uh, to equal treatment uh, has to be part of that uh, as well. If it doesn't have, uh, have that, then um, I don't think it, it can be effective. Uh, I don't think it, it uh, amounts to much if there is not that uh, common set of beliefs and values. Page 174. Yeah. So, Arya, I, I concede to you something here now for a change. So what I concede would be that if, I, if, if, if there is ever, that depends a great deal on John Berger or present here, if there is a second edition, I will change a majority to a great majority, perhaps. <laughs> And, but I will still, I will still have, I think that you were much more right 10 years ago than today. And I think that something has happened really very important. And I speak now through experience. Uh, I want to acknowledge Irena Grozinska Gross sitting there when she was human rights person at the Ford Foundation. We did together, she asked me to help with two conferences between East European and African constitutional lawyers and human rights activists and organizations. And I was surprised how much the agendas differ and how much of the issues that we hear think don't belong to human rights or how much for them uh, 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 the, the so social and economic issues and rights were important and that was for them basically core rights. When we went with Jim Goldston, who couldn't be here, to Peru after Fujimori Montezino were uh, abolished, kicked out, and talked with 
people in Lima about rights, about the political change, etc. They talked about basic, this core rights that you talked about. Then we had a meeting with a number of the human rights NGOs in Cusco, in the Andes, and what they were talking about was different things. For them it was that, you know, the uh, women are beaten by men, and which is not state, basically state issues, which is criminal issue, but for them that was basic human rights issue and the fact that young girls are, 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 are sent to towns for the, uh, uh, to, to work as servants and, uh, uh, and, and for them that was the major core human rights issue and we got back to Lima and talked with politicians and human rights lawyers about these issues. They were saying this is not a problem and all of them had these domestic servants of course from the Andes. And then uh, you see when I went to the to the, to if the I could just inter interrupt, mm -hmm. if, if you say women are beaten by men, this is um, I consider that uh, a core human rights issue in the following respect, that if the state has a responsibility um, to uh, protect um, uh, its citizens, that if the state then excludes um, women from that protection and denies them equal protection of the laws, um, the, um, that seems to me to violate a core human right. That is, they have a right to, uh, to equal treatment, that if the state would protect others against beatings, um, it has to protect women uh, against beatings by men. Okay. Thank you. So I will continue. Then I went to the, to the Philippines for the South and Southeast Asia meeting of human rights and, and uh, legal empowerment groups. And what they were talking basically was group rights, which we both have very skeptical attitude and reject, but they were human rights organizations. They were talking about indigenous group rights. They were talking about other group rights, which were not 10 years as much in the parlance and in this uh, main, uh, main, main language or core, core set of ideas of rights. But for them, it's important. Samuel Martinez of the University of Connecticut wrote a fascinating paper, he's writing a book about the different agenda of human rights NGOs in Latin America and actually in Caribbean of two types. One of them who are basically donor driven uh, uh, NGOs that are representing the, uh, I would call the traditional agenda you mentioned, and the local indigenous NGOs that are pursuing different agendas and are, are basically somehow uh, pre precisely competing for resources with these others. And I had a number of other experiences of that type which would tell me, yes, yes, this, this, this movement also has diversified very much. And I think that, yes, yes I say, great majority will be in second edition, so don't keep me on that, you know, remind me that, but, but, but not all of them. This something happened. The second thing which happened, I believe that 50, 60 years ago in different shape and 30 years ago for another meaning. There was some consensus about philosophy of human rights. I don't think this consensus can be restored. No. I I'm, think I'm sorry to hear uh, yes. that you believe that. Um, I think we have about 15 minutes left and I wonder if we could uh, open this up. Is there a microphone? I never ans uh, answered. Uh, uh, Go ahead. Go Richard's well, questions, but I will answer that. We have a microphone, so if anybody wants to speak, we'll. we'll hmm? Okay, over here. Do you want to answer the question while we're getting the microphone to him? No, actually, you know, about globalization, I think that I uh, uh, would write similar thing because most of the countries that states are back and taller, they still don't, didn't regain capacity to control the economic factors, of, except for a few most powerful countries. So I think that change the states stand taller, but as powerless as, as they were before. And uh, there are a number of reasons that I didn't deal with international justice, except for the historical period, historical part, because I, I really went into four basic different debates. And for me, the, his, the historical justice or international justice is not a subject of a debate. It's basically agreement about that, or mo most of the agreement about it. Okay, 
Um, th thank you very much. My name is Yunus, and um, my question is, b you, you were talking about states, and you, you gave an example of Haiti, for example, and how the prime minister chose or is thinking about choosing planting trees instead of building schools, and the argument on the other side said, no, I choose schools. And, and I think there was a concept that have, has been left out of the conversation, which is progressive realization. Can't we say that, for example, by building those trees, y this is a progressive step towards ensuring all those rights in the long run? And that's, that's my first um, comment. And I, I would like any of you to comment on the, the, the progressive realization concept. The other one is you said that um, you disagree with expanding rights because that makes them lose value or lose enforcement and uh, first of all that assumes that it's only one community working to ensure all rights which i think is not very valid because different commu the human rights communities work on different rights in different ways so for example right to development which you you thought was very broad i think if you talk to someone who's from a a poor African country or a poor Latin American country, I think a right to development would be much more important than a lot of rights that in the, in the U.S. or in the West, for example, would seem prime. Uh, and, and so I think there's, there's a little bit of um, ethnocentrism in that statement. Yeah. Um, okay, look, so I these are two comments I'd I like I you to comment on. I think the questions should mainly you. go to Victor rather than to me. But since uh, that's uh, directed to me, I'll, I'll answer. Uh, very briefly, and, and that is, look, if, if um, uh, a particular um, policy that focuses on um, dealing with environmental degradation is seen as a way of progressively realizing the right to education, then it seems to me that any government can say, look, our policies, let's say, on capital accumulation are a way of um, realizing um, these um, uh, rights, like the right to education, like the right to health care, and it makes um, those rights meaningless. And um, I don't think rights uh, should ever uh, be meaningless. Um, uh, the, the other uh, question with respect to the right to development, uh, again, um, I worry about meaninglessness. And it's meaningless because unless you have a global authority with enforcement powers which can, let's say, um, tax the United States um, at uh, a substantial level and tax uh, the wealthy countries of Europe at a substantial level and tax Saudi Arabia and other wealthy countries at a substantial level and transfer resources to the poor countries. Unless you have that kind of uh, global government, um, how do you enforce um, a, a right uh, to development? Um, I think there's no chance uh, that we will get uh, that kind of global government. Um, uh, I'm well along in years, so it won't happen in my lifetime, but it won't happen in the lifetime of the youngest person um, in this room, and it won't happen in several lifetimes um, after that. What's the point of calling something a right um, if, in, in practice, it is meaningless. That, that's my point. Uh, you, you see, but progressive realization was really one of the, if you read the book by Ann, Marianne Glendon or by Morsing about the creation of the Universal Declaration, progressive realization was, for many of the drafters, crucial thing which even permitted some kind of consensus in 1948. What I claim in this book is that there are different concepts of human rights in 1948, 1978, and 2008. And the 2008 is just bringing to the 1978 concept some elements that were discarded between 48 and 78 and developing or increasing concept for some things that are important with which the theory of rights grapples very with a lot of difficulties and not convincingly like the problem how to use rights for the protection of environment which is basically requires again what you said global government global policy but i do believe for example that if every person had a right to standing about environmental issue would still be very good. 
If, if I would have a right to standing, that means to de require from the government, the government of my country or other country perhaps, is collecting and providing me with information about the environmental consequences of any activity, governmental or non-governmental, and then gives me also the standing to start the procedure to ban some activity or to regu regulate some activity, we would be in much better off than we are. So I believe that these this concepts are evolving. That and I have n I, uh, perhaps difficult would be to me to make a case about 2008 versus 78, but uh, 78 and 48, I can really make a case that there are two different concepts. The consensus that was coined at the end of the drafting process was very broad, and progressive realization and the moral value and the future uh, goals and ideals for the humankind was crucial for that. For 78, both for the politics, international politics, especially of the Western countries, and international human rights movement. Now, civil and political <coughs> rights are becoming crucial and the most important. And the concept is limited compared to this broad consensus of 48. And no wonder that people from non, not, not, not the dictators, but some people, well-meaning people from non-Western countries could say, well, wait a minute, what you brought back, you know, with Human Rights Watch and what you brought back as human rights in 1970s is not what we agreed upon in 1948. It's limited. It, it's leaving out some things that people agreed. So I believe that, that you know, the, the, the notion is very dynamic and not, not once and forever. And this, uh, the, the, that, that somehow relates to this progressive realization as a concept, original concept in 48. Okay. Right. Joanna. And Thank you. Uh, my name is Joanna Weschler. I'm not sure it's a question, but I wanted to go back to that uh, conversation at the very beginning, which was about whether rights are about uh, morality or uh, enforceability. And um, just a comment on the Russian or, uh, well, Soviet or Polish early human rights efforts. I think the fact that those people have referred to the existing law was, in fact, on their part, building a self-defense system and also preempting propaganda because it took enormous courage to do anything of the sort that they were doing. And they, they needed to say that this is something that's completely justified under existing laws, which most citizens didn't realize. And I think it's not because their con concept of rights was uh, very much grounded in their law. It's just that what they were doing to get to the rights was not an illegal activity under existing law in the regime. But I think, well, you are uh, first talked about en enforceability, but then you actually modified your definition of rights as putting limits on power. And if my memory serves me right, uh, in the 1980s up until the early 1990s, the international human rights uh, movement was about putting limits on power, but not about necessarily enforceability, because we would probably not get out of bed if it was something that was necessarily enforceable. Enforce it, yes. It was enforceable, but only through precisely moral pressure and not through uh, an illegal system, because the, uh, the talk about legal enforcement of human rights only really became serious uh, when concept of international justice became something more than a concept and it became reality. So is enforceability and putting limits on power the same thing for you, or would you actually make a distinction? Um, is it the same thing or would I make a distinction? Um, w what I mean by um, enforceability is that there should be a possibility um, of enforceability. Uh, there may be many times and places where in practice um, rights uh, are not enforceable. So if I uh, argue for rights in uh, Burma or Turkmenistan or North Korea, um, there's no possibility um, in that cer political circumstance of enforceability. But in effect, what I'm asking for is um, a system in which, in fact, 
the right, those rights will be enforceable. I'm trying to achieve um, that kind of a, a system. And in that respect, I think placing limits on power uh, and uh, enforceability are the same. But once you do that, once you achieve that result, I claim that you don't need the notion of human rights. You have a notion of constitutional rights or enforceable rights, and not necessarily human. But I want to also thank Joanna because she contributed very much to my book by reading the manuscript and giving me fabulous, fabulous, really helpful advice and comments. Thank you. Okay. Um, I saw one other hand. Here. Here. Yes, in back. And here. And the guy over there. It's not hmm? necessarily the one that says. Okay. My name is Amanda Wetzel, and I'm with the Justice Initiative. And my question concerns, um, I guess, what the role of human rights in the aftermath of ethnic conflict and the way human rights um, have been guaranteed in various peace agreements, and then implemented as a result of those peace agreements plays into um, kind of how the concept of human rights has evolved over time. And I think particularly about um, some experience in Northern Ireland. And in Northern Ireland, there was a peace agreement that gave the Human Rights Commission a mandate to draft a bill of rights that fit the particular circumstances of that conflict. And over a period of 10 years, the Human Rights Commission went on to consult widely on um, a wide variety of topics, including group, groups right, group rights, um, regarding what, rights, what, what should be human rights in the Northern Ireland context. Um, so I was wondering, because there have been many peace agreements that include provisions to expand human rights guarantees in the country that are sometimes imposed on the country and other times left to consultation, how those processes have kind of expanded the, our understanding of the general concept uh, within the international framework, if that makes uh, sense. You know, to, me, to me, that is another proof that it is an ex extremely flexible notion. Because it is talking about what is desirable, not necessarily what is enforceable now and here today. And of course, the peace agreement can take basic fundamental issues of rights and cut them to the needs and, and actual uh, 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 circumstances or demands of particular conflict, and they are called still human rights, and they are basically uh, either narrowed down or shaped to, to, to solve the problem, because the notion is so. I would say that the, of the most universal thing about human rights, besides some basic content, which I agree with Arya, that, and there is all, even a list of such uh, rights that I call uh, that uh, should be universal in this chapter on universality, and I think that we would be in agreement with most of what is in it, but, but what is the most universal is usefulness of the concept for various either conflicts or various demands or various needs of people whenever they are deprived of an enforced uh, a, a possibility or they are creating something new uh, as, as with most of the peace agreements, rules of the game. Just a very quick addition to that. I first started doing work in Latin America in the mid-80s in Guatemala and El Salvador. And if you look at what human rights organizations were doing then in Latin America around post-conflict justice, it was very rudimentary compared to now. I mean, I think this area has expanded and become uh, partly through the contribution of OSI, which I know has uh, done a lot of work on this, it's become much more sophisticated. And Victor has a nice discussion in his book of legal empowerment and questions of access to justice, and not just putting in place the right kind of penal reform, um, but, but actually um, seeking to improve popular access to justice and make uh, rule of law meaningful. OK, I think we have time for one more question. Garth? Thank you. Um, my name is Garth Mankies. Um, my question is for Victor. Victor, um, your description of human rights, or your attempt, your concept of human rights, uh, seems to me to be rooted deeply in your attempt to describe the way that people are using human rights and the way it has historically been applied. Um, but then you, uh, as the title of your book says, you have limits. And these limits suggest that you're, you're in a way, making a judgment about how people should or shouldn't be using human rights. 
Um, and I'm interested in knowing where that limit comes from uh, if it's not just a description of the way that people are using it. Where, what is informing your judgment about where the limit is? Uh, is it connected with your idea about constitutional rights? Um, what is it, what, what is, is it that constitutional rights are the real rights and that it's only rights that can somehow become enforceable constitutional rights that uh, enjoy the limit that you're talking about? What is the basis for the limit? And is it in any way connected with your idea of constitutional rights? Only partly, and this is related to the second chapter on the rights and democracy, where the, uh, uh, I put limits on both democracy and on rights. And I think that uh, excess of rights impoverishes democracy and steals resources and uh, 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 from the uh, uh, political process, which is essential for democracy, and also limits the substance or the sphere of political debate and political process. And actually, I see that the uh, uh, moving of politics into the identity areas is one of the results that so many of the conflicts that were traditionally for politics about resources, other things are already preempted by constitutionalization. So, or either in European Union by the supranational decisions. So, so the politicians that have to quarrel about something go into this <coughs> uh, uh, new realms or old realms and find them extremely effective because they cannot, can be uh, it's more difficult to hold them responsible. So I see the limits in various ways. I see the limits of rights in the, in, the, in, the, in the satisfaction of needs. I'm just very clearly saying that only some needs, some very limited needs of human beings or communities can and should be uh, satisfied by the instrumentarium of rights. And, uh, and what comes to the last chapter, that's basically experience and life experience and looking at others, that I realize that in the s important spheres of life, like, you know, the personal relations, like the sense search of meaning, etc., there are limits not to content of rights, but to usefulness of rights. That we, we, we don't go far in, let's say, uh, 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 you know, I, 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 I bring this to, 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 to great, one greatest, I believe, philosopher of, of rights, uh, Joel Feinberg, you know, with his concept of the uh, 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 Werner's Bill II and the limits to, 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 to rights, and combined him with perhaps not a, as great philosopher, but good scholar Jeremy Waldron, who says that rights are fallback mechanisms. And I do believe that for relationship, let's say love or friendship or other things. That's what basically Joel Feinberg says. Joel Feinberg said in 1971 in the article on nature and limits of rights, imagine place when there is no rights, where let's call it Nowersville. Okay. And, in, and he describes the life in Nowersville. And I wrote on the margin, it's like Poland under communists. You know. <laughs> More or less, he, he really described. And then he, this article became extremely popular and it was reprinted here and there and there. And in 1978, Mr. and Mrs. Bandman were publishing the uh, book, book, collective book on the um, uh, medical problems, you know, of rights. And they asked uh, Feinberg if they can reprint it. And Feinberg said, yes, but I want a postscript also because I gave some thoughts to that. And he said, imagine now a place which is called Nowersville 2 where there are rights and only rights, and everyone has to always enforce and go after their rights. And he says, now this is a social community in which there is no room for forgiveness, love, gift, compassion, and things like that. So this is pretty also inhuman. And basically, that's where Waldron comes, who would say rights are necessary fallback mechanisms. It will be much better to have ideal relationship with other people based on trust, feeling, compassion, all these good things. But love is betrayed and abused, etc., etc. And whenever you are abused, you should have rights. 
to fall back on them. And I think that that's where our both limits and necessity of right. Because a good, a good benevolent ruler could come and say, I know that rights will not give you happiness and love, so I will take away <coughs> from you. It doesn't work. I have to have first rights to be able <laughs> to make self-limitation on, on those. So that's where I, how I consider this philosophical or ethical dimension of limits to, of rights. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. It's a, thank you. As you can see, it's a provocative book, and I recommend reading it. <laughs> thank you.